In 1914, this stamp marked the start of a revolution in the way postage stamps were produced in America. It also introduced a new area of collecting to philately. Stay tuned for details. <music> As early as 1880, private vending machine companies were creating coiled ribbons of stamps out of sheet stamps to be dispensed out of so-called penny-in-the-slot machines. These coil stamps were popular with the public as they enjoyed the convenience of obtaining stamps wherever they happened to be, at a grocery store, at the train station, or even at the post office. Businesses enjoyed the cost savings that they got, too, from utilizing uh, automated stamp affixing machines. Over the years, the popularity of coil stamps grew so great that the Bureau of Engraving and Printing was hard pressed to, to meet the demand for them, and the Postmaster General ordered studies be made on how to increase the production of them. The problem is that coil stamps are made from sheets that are 20 stamps wide by 20 stamps long, and they had to be cut into strips, which were then pasted end to end together, 25 strips for a coil roll of 500 and 50 strips for a roll of 1,000. You can imagine what a slow and tedious job that was. Well, the situation improved a bit when they realized that instead of pasting strips together, they could first paste the sheets together. Well, due to technical issues, they actually had to slice the sheets vertically in half first and then paste those half sheets together. And then when they had the required number of uh, stamps, either 500 or 1,000, they would then cut that giant roll into the individual 10 coil rolls. And at that, the Bureau had reached its production limits. However, the demand and the sales of coils continued to grow beyond the Bureau's uh, ability to meet the demand. Now, as mentioned earlier, at the Postmaster General's request in 1909, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing had set its top mechanical engineer, a man named Benjamin Stickney, to the task of coming up with a faster and cheaper method of producing stamps. And after several years of experimenting, of tweaking and testing, the Stickney Rotary Press came online and it was an immediate and great success. Whereas the previous sheet printing method had 23 discrete handling steps from blank paper to finished stamp sheet, the Stickney Rotary Press reduced that to only eight, and productivity increased dramatically as well, almost sixfold, in fact, from a million stamps a day to nearly six million. Whereas the flat plate printer required the sheets to be printed one sheet at a time and then taken to separate stations for gumming, drying, and perforating, the rotary press had various drums, trays, and compartments built in which handled all these processes together. From wetting the paper, to printing, to gumming, to drying, to perforating, and then finally rewinding onto a roll, 10 stamps wide, which would be set aside for processing into the individual coil rolls later. It should be noted, though, that uh, early on, the perforating operation was removed from the Stickney press and relegated to a separate uh, perforating machine, which incidentally was designed by Stickney. So the Stickney press represented a great leap forward in stamp production for the Bureau. And in his book, The United States Coil Issues from 1906 to 38, author Martin A. Armstrong says that the rotary press became the most productive piece of equipment ever created by the Bureau. So great was the work done by the Stickney Rotary Press, in fact, that a larger model was soon built for the production of sheet stamps. And the Stickney Rotary Press became a workhorse for the Bureau of Engraving and Printing for 48 years, from 1914 until the decommissioning of the last press in 1962. Now, let me take a few uh, moments to just show you how this worked, courtesy of Yeti. Now, like I said, it was a rotary press, which has a drum on which two very thin uh, printing plates were attached, kind of like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm.
So now I have my very own Stickney press. Now each printing plate was 10 stamps across. And if you were printing vertical coils, then you got 15 rows of stamps. If you were printing horizontal coils, you got 17 rows. Now, one of the peculiarities of the Stickney press is that because you had two plates joined on this one drum, you had two joints. And the joints did not butt together perfectly. And you would always wind up with a little ridge or depression where the two joints, where the two plates came together. Now, during the printing of the stamps, ink would collect in those uh, joints and a line of ink would get printed on the stamps between the last and the first stamps of each plate. And you can see that here on this pair of George Washington's where the line has been imprinted across the perforations. Now, just like star-bellied sneeches, these stamps came to be viewed as something special by stamp collectors, and they were willing to pay a premium over similar stamps with no lines on them. And the new stamp collecting area was born, that of joint line pairs. Now, I enjoyed collecting joint line pairs for a number of reasons, one being that I'm not a country completist. I like to pick and choose which issues from each particular country I want to collect, and uh, joint line pairs kind of set their own limit then. You don't have to worry about collecting a whole universe of stamps. There's just a finite set of stamps issued between 1914 and 1962. The joint line adds another dimension of challenge in finding a really nice stamp to add to your collection, as it's already a fairly difficult proposition finding a coil pair with balanced margins along the straight edge and nicely centered between the perfs, and that challenge becomes even that much greater in finding a joint line that bisects the perforations perfectly. And finally, the joint line just adds a little extra bit of visual interest that sets the joint line pair apart from ordinary coil pairs, you know, kind of like star-bellied sneeches. If you're a worldwide collector, you can extend your collection of joint line pairs to other countries as well, as several countries bought Stickney presses for their own stamp production programs, including Belgium, Canada, Czechoslovakia, and Sweden. But that'll be a story for another program. So I hope you found this informative and enjoyable, and I will just leave you now with a reminder to please hit the subscribe button as well as the bell icon so you can receive notifications of future videos as they go up. Until next time, this is Ted the Talking Collector wishing you happy stamping. <laughs>